like it was almost like down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He like sees the kid. Right? Chum. Wait, Chum. Chum is the kid. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Can you hear me okay? And uh, there are some challenges this morning. Garrett, the Dutch night owl from the Netherlands, thank you for that report. Uh, let me try to clue you into what's going on here. Uh, five by five. Thank you. I'm so pl pleased to hear that report. Uh, I'm going to sit here right now and say hi to a few of you. Um, the cameras currently are flip-flopped backwards, and uh, I'm running out of time, and I also don't understand why OBS is such a problem right now. So if you don't mind, let me keep those people off camera. If you don't mind, I'd like to just say hi to a few of you, and then we'll swing you around and show you the whole operation. But the goal at this point is just to be a functional program, and it might mostly just be slides um, and not the fancy two-camera operation. Where are you viewing from? And I, I see some 5 by 5 so you can hear me okay. That's great. Fredericksburg, Texas. Hello from Florida and Indianapolis. And Bill, Montana, Lake Ozark, Missouri. Jennifer's in Boise. Hello, Jennifer. Florida, Vancouver, Washington, Marion, Virginia, Parma, Idaho, Forest Grove, Oregon, Santa Cruz, California, Bozen, Denmark, Santa, San Diego, California, Sonora, Arkansas, Bend, Oregon, Houston, Texas, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Statesboro, Georgia, Coos Bay, Oregon, East Wenatchee. Hello, Adele in Auckland, New Zealand. So, uh, Selenian Block, California, Baltimore, Maryland, Ottawa, Canada, Bavaria, Germany. Hello, Caroline. You're a troll, huh? Okay. Chuckanut, I'm calming down just seeing you here and assuming that you can still see and hear me. Uh, I got to get this off my chest. Things are laboring right now with these cameras. And it's the same cameras I had last week. Everything's identical. Why is it laboring? I've restarted the whole system three times, including the projection system in the room. I cannot get it to function properly. I don't get it. Um, but again, uh, thank you for joining us. It's 11.54, and most of you are watching this in replay, and the program will start in six minutes from now. And I will uh, swing you around and introduce our speaker, and we'll be off and running. I'll put a little bookmark uh, at the beginning of the program so you can avoid watching a replay of me. Uh, I had j j one of my students go and grab me some water. I'm fucking hyperventilating at this point. We'll see if we can get through this one. Woodburn, Oregon, Crescent City, California, Xenia, Ohio. Floyd Burke is from Floyd Burke. Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, you guys are all repeating your names here. Richard Stevens, 5x5. Five five. Thank you. Don's up there in Fairbanks, uh, freezing at the moment, I assume. Uh, the Netherlands, Costa Rica. Hello, Chuck. Kamloops, BC. Northwoods, Wisconsin. That's Gene. Miami, Florida. Bend, Oregon, and so on. Okay, that's enough of me on camera. Uh, let's see how functional we are, even though the cameras are reversed. Even though the cameras are reversed. This one is the wide camera. So there's Jordan Carey. And his, uh, I can show this portion of the camera. Are you going to be a Pied Piper and sit here? We need to fill this. No? Yeah, man. And like... Well, eventually it'd be polite, I guess, to listen to the speaker, but you could do a little pistol move. You could do a little uh, out there in the hallway. You could pretend you have a handgun. So you're following me, and we're going to go down to the front row. <laughs> you have to sit in front of James. That's thoroughly appropriate. Okay, so so we'll, we'll, this will be a documentation on how magnetic Jordan is. This will be a little social experiment. All right, so you can hear me. Can I ask one more time, are we five by five, at least with me? And if so, we will turn on uh, our speaker's camera. Why can you see all this crap? 
Oh, daddy's frazzled. Holy cow. Frazzled, baby. I'm too old for this. Oh, thank you. Gary Paul. Hello. Beautiful photos lately, Gary. Thank you. Okay, well, at least my mic is working. And I guess I need to test this real quick. That. What's that? The face camera. And that's functional. Are you seeing all these things? Hopefully. Oh, wait, you're still on Jordan? Oh, God, this is bad. You're still on Jordan, aren't you? You can't see the fucking screen. Excuse me. Sorry, Patrick. Because I don't have OBS, you cannot see the slides. Okay. Do you have... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. We only have one camera operating. I can't switch you to anything else. Okay. That's what we're doing then. Oh, boy. So... This is an improvisation. I am getting hold of the camera that you have. This is still the only thing you can see. Jordan, we're going away from Jordan. And we're going to have to do that. Wow. Thank you, Gary. We're good just to watch Diane on one camera. That's all we're going to be able to do. Wow. Okay. Uh, it's better than nothing. Right. It makes sense. Since I cannot get OBS to show up with the YouTube broadcast, it makes sense. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Easier said than done. Okay. We, I'm going to turn you on here. Okay. And Hannah, you can still, Hannah, Hannah, still you need you to chit chat for a second. Um, it's okay. So Thank we're going to test Diane's microphone if you guys could chat for another two minutes. Check, 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 check. Just check. letting you know that. Is my uh, mic working? Oh, Mike. Can you hear me? Oh. All I have is the slide and you. I don't have multiple cameras today. So we're just going to just focus with this. So I'm just going to have you right here. And it'll switch back and forth from me to the slide sometimes. It's, we're just going to have one static shot with this camera just showing you this. It's just old school way. So it'll be fine. It'll be I great. have an old school phone too. Can you hear <laughs> Diane, <laughs> home viewers? Diane 5x5? I'll get into five? it. Oh, I'm excited. Diane 5x5? Just the waiting. Five? That's hard. I know. I got stories. You know, I'd like to see it. One of those Netflix series that go on for episodes and seasons forever. Which you can't. Thank you. Thank you. Which camera is this? And the whole. And I could. Okay. Yeah. I well, I could. I could inform well, them and make it accurate. Well, I'm getting greedy. You know, I guess like I'll show you one better. more time. Right. Exactly. You, you know, but no, they'd have to do the whole thing, I but I could tell them what, I could tell my stories, and then they could like embellish All we have and is make, the wide make, shot. make it more right. Hollywood. Is people hearing you right now? Uh, on YouTube, but not here. Yeah, but you didn't hear I made sure. <laughs> they did hear you? They did not hear you. Oh, okay. They can now. But wouldn't that be cool? Of course. I, I, so I actually did write that idea to a screen play writer, no and um, so haven't heard back. You need to keep persisting. <laughs> yeah. They just ask you to write like a page and a half summary. Am I on? Are we on? Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, now. Wonderful hey, to now. have you. Boy, the momentum continues with this series. We have a full room. Jordan Carey, the magnetic person that he is, has allowed this front row to fill up. Way to go. A uh, couple of quick programming notes, a couple of other tidbits, and then we'll go right to our speaker. Thanks again for coming to this. 
We have one more Friday at noon speaker this fall, and that's next week. So next Friday is November 3rd. Aaron Donaghy, who I have featured on a number of videos on my YouTube channel over the last couple of years, will be here with us uh, talking about the Eocene. And there's a nice connection to our topic today. And Aaron and our speaker have been going back and forth by email as well. Uh, I don't know if you want to throw that in or not in your talk today, Diane. So Erin Donaghy from Purdue University. She's just finishing up her PhD. She'll be with us next Friday, November 3rd, Oceanic Plateau, Collision and Breakup in the Pacific Northwest. That's Celestia uh, and also the Yakutat up in Alaska. So that's terrific. Uh, for those veterans of the scene, I've been getting plenty of input from you on what you'd like to see tweaked with this series. Like, where's Vinman's? How come we don't have Vinman's? That's a long story. We got Super One cookies. That's going to have to be it for a while. Hope you're enjoying that. Hopefully you enjoy that. Thank you to the Geology Club members who helped set up and take down. A round of applause for the Geology Club members. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, so feedback, yeah. So you are welcome to sit closer. Uh, if you cannot hear very well, I'm working on a lapel mic system that's going to amplify the speaker in the room. We're not quite ready yet with that, apparently. Been waiting a few days for some help. But if you're not able to hear well, please feel free to fill in closer. And uh, I've lowered the lights just a touch so we can still make sure that our speaker is visible. But uh, sometimes these slides need uh, a little bit darker lighting. So thanks for the feedback on that. And continue. Uh, to suggest to Hannah and I some feedback, and we'll try to do our best to make it work for you. He pauses for dramatic effect. <laughs> I'll say it. I'm down to one camera. I don't know what's going on, but I, if you watch the replay of this, we just have one static shot of Diane uh, and the screen, and I'm not changing cameras, and we're not doing other things. It's going to work great for Diane it's going to be a little bit different than the rest. I'm basically talking to myself to calm myself down. Okay, great. Our speaker today is Diane Grudy, and she grew up in a mining town in Montana in amongst the Stillwater Complex, and she got a bachelor's degree in geology from Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, back in the late 90s. And late before I turn 70s. it on to our speaker, I want to remind the 304 and the 504 students that Rex, dear old sweet Rex, would you mind standing up quick, young fella? So Rex is the pinch hitter for the instructor of 304 and 504 today instead of Tim Melbourne. So if you're in those classes, check in with Rex before you take off today, okay? Awkward transition to our speaker, Diane Grudy, who is speaking about exploration, development, and geology of the Wenatchee Gold Belt. Please help me welcome Diane. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. It's, it's great to be here, to be back among geology students in a geology department again, and to see all the changes. It's really great. So, um, yeah, I grew up in a mining town, and I went to college in Durango, Colorado, and I graduated 1979. Okay. Not 90s, the late 70s I graduated. I'm frazzled, Diane. What can I say? <laughs> you don't know how many things this guy gets wrong. Um, and I went straight into mineral exploration from with my BS in geology um, in Nevada and Colorado. And then I became the mine geologist at the Cannon Gold Mine in Wenatchee, Washington. And then from there, I did mineral claim um, I did the inspections of the, the mining claims all around the state for the federal government and wrote mineral reports of uh, federal lands. So my little old bachelor's degree did very well for me for almost 20 years. Um, and then when I did get a master's later in the late 90s, um, it wasn't in geology. So I had, I've had two very interesting careers and um, so the talk I'm going to give you, it's a little bit different today than what you're used to probably because I come to you from an industrial background, not an academic one. And the information I'm going to share is all 35 to 40 years old. So my slides are from, they're old. and <laughs> The pictures you're going to see um, are from a time before computers where we did all our mapping 
by hand. We used ink on mylar for our maps. So you're going to see those maps. And um, we didn't have GPS. If you can imagine doing geology without those kind of tools. Well, you can do geology without all those tools and all that technology. Because geology isn't about technology. It's about your creativity. It's about your imagination. Um, it's about being that kind of person that just needs to solve a problem. You just can't get it out of your head. Why is that there? What's that? How did that happen? Just that kind of a, a thought process. That's what a geologist is. The tools can help us. It can speed things up. Like it's much faster to, to use a good geostatistical package than to do polygon method of ore reserves. But, um, you know, a lot of good geology has been done with very little, very little tools. If you think about the prospectors back 100 years ago, um, they just had their imaginations. So to modify that quote by Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than technology. <laughs> so um, uh, as a mining geologist, the company doesn't like have a big emphasis on doing research, right? You have a lot of work to do. It doesn't involve research. So at the Cannon Mine, we were very fortunate to have um, students like you who came to work and who decided to do their master's thesis and their PhD thesis at the mine. And they were the ones who um, did the dating for us and, and took the questions back to their professors and asked their professors the questions about what we were seeing underground. They're the ones that made our thin sections. And so I'm really indebted to those graduate students. And I'm going to be presenting some of their work today, um, mostly um, Larry Ott, who was a classmate of mine in Durango, who did his PhD at the Cannon Mine. So we worked really closely together. And um, he would come from University of Idaho about once a month and um, you know, I'd bring all my maps, all the core logs, all that, and, and tell him what we'd been seeing and take him underground and show him. And then we would have a lot of conversations about what is this and where did it come from doing that work. So we had students from University of Idaho, University of Washington, and Portland State. And we worked with the professors like Peter Symes and Michael Cummings and people like that back in the day. So I'm really happy that two of my old colleagues are here today, the people I worked with in Nevada back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, back when a lot of those Carlin-type deposits were being discovered. We worked together in the field. OK, so let's talk about the, the Wenatchee Gold Belt, and more importantly, a reason to care about the Eagle Creek structure. And see, I'm old school here with my pointer. I don't want a laser pointer. I want a stick. <laughs> So a reason to care about the Eagle Creek st structure. Oh, yeah, I'm doing the slides myself. So let's start. The Eagle Creek, um, I mean, the Wenatchee Gold Belt has two major pro producers um, in it. And the first one we'll talk about is the Cannon Mine. This is where I worked. Um, and this shows the proximity of the Cannon Mine to the city of Wenatchee. It's just across the street. This is the Cannon Mine head frame. This is the, the B reef knob of silicified chumstick sediments. That's um, the ore body um, in exposure here. This is the Wenatchee Dome Rio Day site that we were lucky to be able to do our production development in because it's so competent. We could make the headings really big. We didn't have to use a lot of ground support in this Rio Day site. And we're right outside of town. So, um, Cannon Gold Mine was second largest underground gold mine in North America at the time. And North America means Mexico, Greenland, Canada, United States. The only uh, other larger gold mine underground was uh, in the Yukon at that time. Uh, we mined every day for nine years, produced one and a quarter million ounces of gold, two million ounces of silver. So it's not a huge deposit, but it's a profitable one. The company made over 600 million, and today it would be over three, 3 billion. So the other big producer in the Wenatchee Gold Belt is the Lovett Mine, which is the D reef. So these silicified outcrops are called reefs in mining terminology. 
So the Dee Reef was the sixth largest gold mine in the United States back in the 50s and 60s. They actually, the first claim was actually staked on it in the 1880s. Um, it, was, it was discovered, um, but they could never really get the milling to release the fine grain gold because these deposits are pretty fine grain gold. We're not coarse gold like you see in the Swak mining district. Um, it's finer grain. So it took a better milling process and it took until the 50s to get that. But they also mined a million tons with a million ounces of combined gold and silver. So there were four other mines in 1986 in Washington state, four other gold mines. Apex was in the Swak mining district. Um, the mini mine was a little open pit up by Carlton that actually uh, is a hazmat two site today. They're still cleaning it up because they used cyanide heap leach and they let it, they let it go <laughs> into the soil. And it's a, it's a bad, it's a mess. And then Republic and Gold Hill were also in a similar geologic environment, a graben with volcanics and sediment, sedimentary rocks, similar to our cannon deposit. Here's our product, um, native gold, electrum, perargyrite. Perargyrite is um, silver antimony or silver antimony sulfide. Is that what it is? Yeah. So it's the silver veins that you see is the perargyrite. Uh, when we would blast into it underground, if there was perargyrite in the rock, we'd see bright red for, before it oxidized black. It's called ruby silver. It's a bright red color on exposure. So um, the silver minerals, the gold, quartz, calcite, um, adularia in the veins, and pyrite, a gold-bearing pyrite. Uh, let's see, where am I here? <laughs> okay, I think that's all I have to say. So here's the, the D reef outcrop, which is the host rock for at the... Um, the old Lovett mine. You see this exposed on the on Squilchuck. If you go skiing at Mission Ridge, you drive right past this. Um, very steeply dipping bedding, um, really hard resistant rock because of the silicification, the alteration of the rock. So in, back in the old days, people tended to think it's it's very different than the surrounding sediments. So they ha there was a controversy over how old it was. And some geologists believed, and we even, in our first paper, we wrote that this is possibly swak formation in the Chumstick Basin. We, we hypothesized that on this Eagle Creek structure, which was a structural high, that possibly some of the older rock was actually exposed. But that since has been um, discounted with Aaron Donahue's dating in the modern dating. We know there's no rock that old in the Chumstick Basin. So it's just altered chumstick sediments and they're really deformed. There's at least two periods of deformation in these rocks. So another couple pictures of the, the D reef. You can see the steeply dipping beds. And over here is some of the old mining. They just, they built these ladders up to these upper adits and they went in, they were high grading the, the veins up in there. So these reefs, um, this is what makes up the Wenatchee Gold Belt are these, these reefs that, out, that crop out. That I just showed you the pictures of the D reef here. But then there's the C reef is another little one. And these, these have underground workings in them. The B reef is where we discovered the Cannon mine uh, ore body. And the D, B reef is just a little knob and it had old 1960s underground workings. This is... Uh, the A reef up there is actually altered uh, silicified andesite with calcite veins. And it's the, the upper part of the system where it's very weakly mineralized. And then we have the F and the G reef up there. So I was like, where's the E reef? A, B, C, D. There's another, across Squilchuck Creek, there's a, a thing called Compton's Knob. And I guess that's where but it must be E reef, I don't know. E, F, and G. So this lies along the Eagle Creek fault zone. And within the fault zone, we also have volcanic rocks, Saddle Rock, Hornblende andesite, Old Butte andesite. These are other andesite bodies. 
There's some basalt at the base of Saddle Rock up Dry Gulch. There's some basalt down here near the Rooster Comb. Uh, so this, the ore is bounded on the west by andesite. And over here on the east, we have the Wenatchee Dome Ryoday site. These are felsic intrusives, intrusives. Rooster Comb, um, another Ryoday site. These are, both of these are bounded. They have a rim around them of perlite, which is a, a glassy uh, mineral caused by the, on the outside by, by cooling. So we know that these are separate ore bodies from drilling because uh, we found that perlite core around both of them. It hadn't been breached. So what else does this say? Oh yeah, okay. So those are the rock types in the uh, Wenatchee Gold Belt. And you also see the proximity to Wenatchee here. The end of Miller Street is that little Wenatchee Dome and the Cannon Mine, right at the end of one of the streets in town. So this is the Hornblend andesite, um, Saddle Rock andesite. It looks like a, a saddle. And this is the A Reef, which is weakly mineralized andesite, the top of the system. Here's the house where uh, Ed Fallis, the project manager, lived in. We were so fortunate as exploration geologists that we lived right there on site in houses. We didn't have to fly in in a helicopter. We didn't have to drive in 10 miles in a pickup truck uh, every day. We just get up and walk across the street over to the, the mine site. He had a house, I had a house. That was kind of unusual. One of our exploration tools is that pine trees tend to grow on these solidified outcrops. You see that? So this is a picture of the, the property uh, that we first leased and where we began our exploration. So like I said, I lived in the house over there. Project manager lived here. This is the Wenatchee Dome Rio Day site. And then the rooster comb is up here. This is the little bee reef knob where we had access underground to begin our, our drilling. So we drilled out this area here to begin with. Um, Ed came first in 1981 and started up the project by dewatering, hiring a couple local people to go down underground and dewater the workings and stabilize them. He set up an office, he, got, he set up an assay lab, he hired assayers from Silverton, Colorado. Um, he did all the project management work, uh, getting the leases on the land. And then he called me up, I was in Silverton in an, on an underground project. He called me up and said, would you come to Wenatchee to do the geology here? And I said, sure. So I came, I arrived the same day that the drillers arrived and um, made a, started, we started drilling out this area. So that's how we divided up the tasks. This is the Columbia River. This is the city of Wenatchee, um, Miller Street, Circle Street. Has anybody been to Wenatchee and recognized this stuff? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Field Camp was there. I recognize some of you, some of you guys from Field Camp this spring. Okay. Oh, I just got to remember to breathe. <laughs> it's fun for me. I haven't been up here like this in a long time. So where was I? Oh, okay. Back to the Wenatchee Gold Belt and the Eagle Creek Fault Zone. So they're one and the same. And they run kind of like that, just outside of the town of Wenatchee. And uh, the Cannon Mine is located in here. And the D Reef is located in here. So those are the two um, ore bodies that have actually gone into production, those two. But this thing runs, this is the area that we explored. I mean, it runs further to the northwest and it comes down here, south, southeast, under the Columbia River basalts, under Stemilt uh, Hill. So it's all within the, what used to be called Chewakam Graben, but now is called Chumstick Basin because it's not really a Graben, but um, it's all these, Middle Eocene sediments that were quite rapidly deposited into the basin after it opened up between the Eniat and the Leavenworth faults. So it's um, 
people, we talk a lot about Indiana and Leavenworth Fault as far as the Chumstick Basin, but nobody ever talks about the Eagle Creek Fault. And it's actually probably the zone of the most displacement. It's got a, it had so much faulting along there and it's the plumbing system for the mineralized, for the ore bodies and the mineralized rock. Here's the location of the Cannon Mine and the Lovett Mine. They're just right together like that. So over on the, wet, on the east side, we have the Swake Nice. And over here, we have the Plutonic rocks of, the, of Mount Stewart Batholith. And then the Swak Basin with the Swak sediments and the, and the Tianaway basalts. Similar environment to the Chumstig Basin and also has gold mineralization associated with those basalt dikes into the folded sediments. So the folds in the swak look very much like the folds we had over here. I keep wanting to say next slide, and then I remember I have to push the button. So like a lot of mining districts, these are sort of typical shallow, low temperature, um, low sulfide, epithermal deposits that form when, when you have ground movement and you have volca volcanic source, magmatic, a magmatic source, um, and porous rock. You get this water circulating from the heat. You get maybe a mixture of um, meteoric and magmatic fluids, um, and it circulates, we think, in the, in the at the Cannon Mine, it was maybe about three million years of mineralization that concentrated the metals. So these are kind of typical, similar to the Knob Hill deposits um, up in Republic. Some of this, the mines in Nevada are like that. So at the Cannon Mine, we didn't really see evidence of any uh, surface deposits. It looked like it was all um, either all underground, but pretty shallow or that the surface deposits have been eroded off. So as Amera, the company I worked for, um, did exploration up and down the Eagle Creek structure for 10 miles. So five miles north of the Cannon and LD mine. Uh, we just had two little targets up there. Most of the drilling targets that define mineralized, it's questionable whether it's ore grade or not, but mineralized zones were found to the southeast here, all the way under Stemilt, Stemilt Hill, Stemilt Creek. And oh, I forgot to say 57, whoops. Whoops, how do I go backwards? Forwards, 57 miles of drilling, 300,000 feet of core to log just on the exploration, not counting all the underground <laughs> core that we logged. So we had to hire quite a few students and we had a lot of geologists at the mine eventually. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so this is Gresson's 1983. I actually met and had conversations with Gresson's who was mapping in the area before he was killed in a plane crash on Mission Ridge. Um, and he didn't finish his work. But he had, there was the thinking of the day was that we had, um, that the basin had opened up on, um, by compressive stress, north-south compressive stress, and this northwest um, extensional and east-west extensional um, component. But actually, when we got underground and started mapping, we started finding uh, more northeast southwest compression, like this way, squeezing with the northwest southeast extension. We, it, it looked different, and it, it does um, kind of go along more with the story of Silesia. So, the structure that we saw underground. Um, First of all, you have this main northwest trend of the, the Eagle Creek, the Eniat, the Leavenworth Faults, all running northwest. And then at the Cannon Mine, we had these really tight, overturned folds, like this kind of squeezing. 
and a thrust fault that offsets the ore right there. And then at the D reef, we have these thrust faults that run through here, offset by these north-south faults, okay? And we know these are strike-slip faults because we, we did development across this fault many times at the mine, and we could see the displacement, we could see the slick and sides and the folds in the fault zone. So these are right lateral strike slip faults. We also know that because the D reef ore is offset. It's here and then it's here and then it's here. So this all kind of goes with that idea of northwest southeast compression that includes the pitcher syncline um, that creates these thrust faults. But how these formed um, is kind of a puzzle. It could have either been formed by right lateral movement on the Eagle Creek structure with a compressional component. So this thing moves this way but squeezes this way. Or it could be earlier movement on, one of, on this north-south fault with this moving right laterally and squeezing that. I'm not using very technical terms, but. Uh, and then the, the Wenatchee Dome Rio Day site is right here in the, it's separated from the ore body by this north-south right lateral fault. And we did a channel sampling across that contact on all the levels and did trace element comparison between the Rio Day site and the ore body and we couldn't find any connection. The Rio Day site emplacement looks like it's post-mineral, but these folds are maybe pre-mineral or, or at least intramineral because, well, let me go keep going here. Does that make sense? So that's a cross section looking west of the Cannon Mine ore body. So you see the folds I was just talking about, these east-west trending folds. Um, and then this thrust fault here, this reverse fault that puts part of the ore on top of the other part of the ore. And then another fold and another fold. And then the B reef would be sticking up here. The little surface outcrop would be sticking up there. Um, it's all this uh, porous sandstone and siltstone bounded by sheared mudstone beds on the top and the bottom. So there's structural control to the ore and there's stratigraphic control to the ore. Um, because when this, when this folded, um, it sheared, the sandstones folded like brittlely, the um, clay stones, mudstones sheared, they formed ductily and they, they created like a barrier trapping the mineralizing fluids, okay? So we, we had silicification of the sediments in the, the sandstones and siltstones. And then we had the folding that created these radial extension joints around the folds, like that, like when you fold something and you get breaks like that in it. And then we had our first stage veins, which were our highest grade vein, veins um, filled these extension joints around the folds. Those were the highest, that had the most gold in it. Later, we had a normal faulting with a second stage of veining that cross cut those early veins. So it's very complicated. Um, and this isn't set in stone. This is just our ideas from what we saw underground. And you can see how uh, close this is to the surface. A lot of it is. This goes down pretty deep, but this is all pretty close to the surface there. So another plan view of the Cannon Mine ore body. Um, here's the Rio Day site, separated by this north-south fault from the ore body. And then we have those, those fold axes and the thrust fault and it folds down and comes back up again. So because of the, di the um, direction of the folds, we had to orient our stopes differently. The stopes underground had to be oriented north-south 
because the folds were east-west. And then down here, we oriented the stopes east-west because our structures were more northwest there. So here's the north-south fault or our day site. And then here's going into the ore body. There's that thrust fault uh, with some underground mapping that's by hand, ink on mylar <laughs> by me. So that's how we uh, set up the mine plan. This is the D reef showing you again, these thrust faults that are offset by these north, south, right lateral faults. See that? And then those faults go up to be the fault between the Raude site and the Cannon Mine ore body. We thought maybe they were tear faults. You know, sometimes you get thrust faults um, and then you get a, they, get, they can, when they're moving, they'll open up with tear faults like that. So they're perpendicular to the thrust fault. So this is kind of comparing, oh, how'd that get so out of line? Comparing Aaron Donahue's dates, which I think are much more accurate than ours. We had trouble getting good dates. Um, comparing her dates with our dates with the tectonic history. So we had, those are our dates, 82 to 88, by different authors and our own work. Um, the basin and subbasin formed by dextral stripe slip faulting following Siletza accretion. And then we got the Trumstick formation sediments being kind of dumped into the basin. Um, they were like alluvial fans and um, pretty poorly sorted and with a lot of porosity. Uh, and, and with active faulting and folding going on at the same time as the sedimentation. Then the Eagle Creek Fault got most active, and this is when we think our mineralization occurred, like I said, like about a three million year time period. Our dates on the Agilaria in some of those stage two veins is 44.2 million years. And uh, Erin puts that kind of a date range. So see, her dates are not that different than ours. She shortens it up a little bit, though. But um, Eagle Creek Fault with probably a transpressive kind of uplift component, pre and post mineral folding, shearing of the mudstone beds, and the intrusion of these andesites, kind of all at the same time. So the volcanic rocks are the heat source the, um, that get the epithermal system going. And then in placement of the Monachi Dome rhyolite, we saw from field evidence underground that that was post, post or the emplacement of it was post or It might have been down there percolating, but um, that's the kind of date we got on it. She gets a little bit older date, which is probably more accurate. But, Kind of just shows that all this stuff is happening at the same time, basically. Oh, and then down there, you can't read what I put, but uh, the later folding of the pitcher syncline, like the cascade arc starts to form, and we get the northwest, um, northeast compression that created the pitcher syncline and um, those thrust faults we see at the D reef, which are post or post mineral. Does this make sense? <laughs> yeah, really? Good. Okay, let me see, where are we? Stages of mineralization we kind of talked about. The first silicification and pyrotization, gold-bearing pyrite of porous sediments creates this hard host rock that's bounded by impermeable mudstones that trap the solutions, okay? So what it meant for us in the mine was that our, our, ground, our ground rock, our host the, the, the whole ore body uh, was mineralized to a degree. And when you throw in the veins that are higher grade, it sweetens it so that we could take huge blocks of ore. We could mine big blocks of ore because the, the um, host rock was also mineralized from that first stage. Second stage, we got the AC extension fractures filled with veins quartz electrum pyrite. And then veins were offset by later veins. And then um, stockwork breaches. So I have some photos of this stuff. 
So here's a photo of the folds I'm talking about. This is how intense the folds were underground. And um, the mudstones were sheared. This doesn't show the sheared mudstones, but uh, they were very kind of dangerous underground because they were just so uh, crumbly and uh, we had to do a lot of ground support when we crossed those underground. But this would be all silicified and then we would have this is not mineralized here, but if it was, because um, this is just the cut for where we built the mill, it's the, the high wall behind the mill, uh, we would have radial fractures around these folds that would be filled with um, high, higher grade vein veins. So here's, this is just showing the pervasive silicification with gold bearing pyrite in the wall rock. And then stage one veins that terminate at the claystone, mudstone beds. These were the barriers to the solutions. Um, and these are per, um, perpendicular to the bedding because they're on those, the hinge lines of the folds. And then stage two veins were on normal faults that um, cross cut everything else. And you see how there's many periods of veining, like it comes in and then another solution comes in and then another solution comes in and builds up the layers on the vein walls. So here's one of the veins, comes in straight and then the, the interior was often brecciated, like the solutions got more volatile as time went on and they were um, breaking things up as they moved up through here. Oh, that also shows a, the cross-cutting relationship of two veins, uh, brecciated centers of the veins. But it's all mineralized. This shows some visible gold. We didn't see visible gold very often. Like I said, the gold's very fine grain, so visible gold was uh, pretty rare. But this also is a cross-cutting vein here. And then just the mineral assemblage over time, a lot of quartz at the beginning, a lot of pyrite, and then kind of the agillaria came in, the calcite. Over here we have the clays and the pyrite, that's our, um, our upper level, like where the A reef is. <clears throat> and then perargyrite, electrum, the gold, the gold and silver minerals are down here. So it's a really simple mineral assemblage. And this is the Cannon Mine. At the D Reef, they had a, a slightly different mineral assemblage, which made us think it's a whole different system, um, a whole different epithermal system. So how did we find it? We went underground with a diamond drill and we started drilling. And then we made maps, or I did, made maps of the what we saw in the drilling. And that's pretty much how we found it. Like, it's all underground. It's you just have the little surface exposures, but it doesn't tell you much. Um, it's very complex and you wouldn't never see that from the surface because the surrounding rocks are not folded and faulted like that. It's only within the Iglo Creek fault zone that things look like that. So we tried these other things. We did find uh, soil anomalies, arsenic and mer mercury over the ore body. Once we knew where the ore body was, we did soil sampling and we found anomalies. And then we also had some, there's a difference in resist, resistivity between the ore body and the outside rock. So that worked okay. And then, like I said, pine trees grow on the outcrops. So that was kind of an exploration tool. I mean, you could say at the, at the, oh, never mind. So other things we tried that didn't work so well, all of this stuff. So like I said earlier, geology is not about technology. It's up here. <laughs> It's using a drill and making a map, and a map is all from up here, your imagination of, gosh, what is that doing? This is our first access underground to our first drill station in the B Reef, the winter time. Uh, here's our under, first underground drill station, kind of like my office. And we also had surface drills. This is up at the A Reef, and that's Saddle Rock and the site in the background. We had to put um, soundproofing up and fence the mud pits because there were so many people wandering around. We're, we're right on the side, on the edge of town. 
So this is the property we started on. After about nine months, we had done all this drilling from underground and completely uh, drilled this out and had delineated a, 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 a small ore body, 850,000 tons, pretty close to the surface. Um, and the company said, great, let's do an open pit with a cyanide heap leach. And they went to the city and said, we want to do open pit with cyanide leach. And the city said, no way, no way. So we had to keep drilling. We had already checked out this area to the south here. And all these holes this way, um, the ore just kind of grades to the west. You, you uh, get into weakly mineralized andesite, but the uh, grades are, they all kind of grade out this way. We had already, we knew that the A reef didn't have much value to it. So really our only choice was this property across the street, which is the Appalachian Riding Club. It's horses and a riding, riding arenas, and people out there on their horses. And uh, they had never, they'd been approached before by mining companies to drill there. They had never let anybody drill there. But for some reason, they, we convinced them into letting us set up in their parking lot over the winter of 1983. They let us put two drills here in their parking lot for two months, okay? So our first drill rig was over here and it was, a, we did two vertical holes. Um, the first one went down through, through here. It was a dud, there was nothing. 100 feet over this way, our next hole down vertically there, we started having core that looked like that, visible gold in the core which is not very common. So it like we had to start drilling really fast and drill as many holes as possible in two months. We drilled nine holes from that spot. And then we um, moved the drill over there to behind my house. I live just across the street. We put the drill in my backyard and we drilled there and we found more ore there. So um, after a bunch more fill-in drilling, uh, we came up with a picture that looked kind of like this where this was, was our discovery hole was right up here on the very edge. This is just shows you how easy these deposits are to miss. And the other one was a dud. So we drilled, a, we kind of drilled out this edge for a couple months and then we moved the drill over here. We found the B neath zone from the B north. And so then we went back underground, did some underground um, excavation to where we could get in and, and define this better underground but it's all under the riding stable. So we wondered if it had something to do with horses and horse droppings and precipitation and you know alkaline conditions and from the horse droppings. But anyway, that could be an exploration tool. Look for horses. Okay, you see Wenatchee Dome, Bee Reef. Bee West was the first little thing that we uh, delineated and then we found this. All right, so pretty exciting times. Again, another handmade map that just happened to be in a box in my basement um, showing the folds and the thrust fault, A reef, B reef, the Cannon Mine ore body, the Rod Day site. And this is north this way. This is a plan view that's kind of turned sideways. Okay. And that's how it looks in cross section with really old fashioned mapping. And the, the sheared mudstone beds that um, form the boundary to the ore. So then we had to go into very fast track permitting. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, we did all that in 10 months. EIS, lots of public hearings, all the concerns of the public, you know, and there were a lot. So we had to abide by a lot of conditions. We had to widen Miller Street for the trucks. We had to do a reclamation bond. And then this is the big thing, zero subsidence. We're gonna take out all this 5 million tons of ore from very close to the surface. And we're gonna have zero <laughs> subsidence, meaning we have to cement the drifts underground, the stopes. 
Here's our first startup crew. Um, job service did the hiring, and so they put women in the mill and women driving truck underground and women in the assay lab. And we had a pretty diverse crew, which I'm happy to say that. Uh, we had these double barrel drills that could drill out a face really fast because we were on fast track for production. And the reason was gold prices were dropping. When we started exploration, gold was at $800 an ounce. Um, by the time we finished, gold was like $200 an ounce. So gold prices were dropping through the uh, 80s and 90s. Here's the miners loading around, and you can see the silicified sediments there. There's the mill excavation. That's that fold I showed you earlier. Here's the shaft going down. We had a 620-foot shaft. 12 feet wide, all concrete lined. And it was to hoist, hoist the ore out and put it into the mill. Here's the bee reef knob. We had the little added here that was our first uh, access underground. The bottom of the shaft with the primary crusher. So all the ore would get dropped down to the primary crusher and then it would get hoisted out the shaft to the ball and rod mills to crush it further. There's the mine, the mill complex, the shaft, and the riding club. So the ore body is like, just neatly fits right in this property that we, you know, had leases. I think we had like four um, people who got royalty payments, people who held the mineral rights that we paid royalty payments to. This is the Wenatchee Dome Rhyolite, like I said, broad day site. Uh, very competent, really good for, for doing development in. And we had to build this humongous tailings dam, okay, to hold like 8 million tons of black slime tailings that came out of the mill. This is, has no concrete in it. It's all um, compacted gravels and, silt and sands and gravels and clays compacted over and over by trucks. It's huge. It's the largest earthen structure in Washington state. And um, our mining engineer had in his office um, a glass case with a gun in it. And it said on it, in case of dam failure, break glass. <laughs> because if it had failed, it would just flood the town with all this nasty stuff. Here's the main portal, or the only portal that we had, going down the 15% decline to get underground with Don Cannon. He's the guy we named the mine for because he was the geologist up in Canada who was going through the literature and found Wenatchee as a, hey, there was a big mine there and Cypress Minerals had had some good intercepts in their drilling in the 70s. So he sent us to Wenatchee to do the exploration. So we named the mine for him. One of our very first computer plots that we were so excited about um, is plotted the underground. So here's that portal I just showed you. Here's the shaft. And this shows how we got the access underground. We had to go around this, down this ramp to get to the level of the ore zone. And then the colored areas show the ore. And we put in 50 foot levels um, to access the ore. There's more ore down here. This, is, uh, this map's not finished. And then we did um, drilling down from the bottom levels to try to find something at depth, but never found anything more. This is the, where the underground crusher was. So we had about five or six miles of underground workings. That's how we got around uh, in these John Deere tractors with little cages on the back that we could carry people and samples and stuff. This is how we mined. We would um, put in these 50 foot levels and then they would put a raise up and then they go in and drill slices, 10 foot slices, blast them. They come in and muck it out from the bottom and then, and then retreat back every 10 feet. They'd blast it off and take it out. And then when that was done, the bottom was done, they would come in with a backfill truck and they would dump cement. We cemented the open stopes. Um, they'd drive right in on top of the cement, and they'd fill that whole thing up, and then they'd do it again on the top, the top area. So this whole thing would be cemented, this whole thing would be removed and cemented, and once the cement cured, 
we'd go in and take the center pillar too. So we were getting a very large extraction on the ore. Here they are drilling those holes down between benches. Um, they can, it's remote drilling. It's pretty high tech stuff. So it's safer that way, mucking it out. I had a sampling crew that sampled every round as it was mucked out underground. There's like 20 rounds, I mean 20 um, headings a day. And every time they blasted, my sampling crew would run in and take samples. And then they're dropping it down the ore pass to the crusher underground. And then this is the backfill process where they put up a chain link fence there to kind of keep it from going out. So here's the backfield truck dumping the cement into the open stope, driving right out across on top of it, and he's running it with remote control. And he's gonna, they're gonna eventually fill that whole thing up with cement. And you can see the arcosic sandstone here with the veins running in it. Better finish up, huh? So there's that uh, chain link fence holding back the backfill. It would take, I don't know, a few months to cure before we could go in and take the ore out next to it. So one of my jobs, which is pretty hard to do, um, it was to figure out how much gold we had, how much gold we had mined, how much gold was in each ore block, what to pay the royalty holders for how much gold we took off their leases. So <laughs> we'd have to, like I said, we sampled every round with scoops out of the bucket. And then we would average those. We would compare that average to the drilling average. We'd drill out these blocks. We get just tons of assays and we'd be averaging them and throwing out the highs. Like here's a 2.2 ounces per ton next to a 0 0.1, 0 0.1 next to, you know, it's crazy. It's so erratic because it just depends on whether you hit a vein or not. And it depends on the angle that you're drilling. And, so crazy and we didn't have like a geostatistics package that could do this for us and you know i don't it's hard with the nugget effect in a in a gold gold mine so anyway i did that i calculated the royalty payments every quarter and actually it came out pretty accurate just using a calculator <laughs> so the ore would be crushed underground to about like five inches like fist size would be hoisted out the shaft and then it would go through the, a series of these rod and ball mills to crush it down to like minus 200 mesh like talcum powder and then it would go through the flotation process where they they add chemicals that have an affinity for the metals and they pump in air that makes it frothy and it floats the um, bubbles up to the top and then they're scooped off and put in the next so we could send like 0.2 uh, ounces per ton rock to the mill and it would come out concentrated 25 times to five ounces per ton concentrate. And then the concentrate was dried and then it was put on trucks, taken down to the rail yard, um, taken by train to Seattle, put on barges and went to smelters in Japan. <laughs> in West Germany sometimes too. The foreign smelters were more efficient. They were more honest. We got a better uh, smelter return. So we were selling the gold around, pre-selling it at 400 an ounce because prices were dropping. So people were speculating on and paying forward for the gold. Um, and the mine was making about 100,000 a day. But gold prices in 1994 caused the mine to close. We had just done a four-year mine plan in 1989, and that's when I left after I did the four-year mine plan. And then they closed in 94. That means the underground workings all had to be filled in. Uh, the mill buildings all removed, everything put back to, to norm, put back to the way it was. So we went from this in its height and this, um, to this is what it looks like today. So the, this was the cut, you can't see it. The cut for the mill buildings was right here. That's where that big old fold is. Here's the bee reef knob. Here's where the shaft was right here. Um, the portal is right over there, but it's all shut off. It's all plugged up. 
so it's gone. I kind of wish they would have kept the head frame maybe and made like a little mining museum or something. So that's what it looks like today. Same with the tailings dam. This is what it looks like today. And from the top, it's all filled in with topsoil and planted grass. It's very nice. The land went to the land trust and then it went to Appalachian Riding Club. They've inherited the whole land of the mine and there are covenants on it that it will never be mined again. So here's my references. I don't know. Erin sent me her paper, but I don't know what bulletin of GSA that's from. But anyway, here's references for further. I gave you guys um, our reports. A lot of this came from Larry Ott's PhD thesis and then our uh, first paper together here. But also Jake Margolis uh, talks about the mineralization to the south that's really interesting too and really complicated. So I want everybody, I want you to tell everybody you have met the golden girl of America's Mines. <laughs> <laughs> and you've heard her talk. Uh, my mother actually found this on the check stand in one of those magazines on the check stand. Yeah. She said, that's my daughter. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Questions? Oh, I went so long. Oh, you're fine. Too long. You're fine. Really fast questions, or we can talk afterwards. Yes. Oh, good question. I was just asking, um, just asking, what's your name, Andrew, about that? Yeah. He said it might be in a warehouse, uh, the, the GSA, who would have it? The state. The state might have it in a warehouse. I know Azamara donated the maps the whole filing cabinet full of maps was donated to the state department of mines. And he said they might have maybe some of the core in a warehouse. We're not, we don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I left in 89 and it continued, you know, for another five years. So, but our uh, mine environmentalist actually was Marie Garrett. She was a, a woman who did excellent reclamation. This is a, the, the way mining should be done, you know, and so often it's not done well. Go ahead. I mean, yeah. Uh, thinking from the standpoint of our students who will be getting their bachelor's soon, I'm, I'm really impressed that you said you got your bachelor's degree in 1979, and then by 1981, just a couple of years later, you're working on this really complex problem. So what did you feel in your education and afterward prepared you best for for Oh, I should be repeating the questions, right? If you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. Thank you. What, pre what and well, the first question was, what happened to the 57 miles of core? And I said that some of it may have got donated to the state. I'm not sure. And then the second question, what prepared me most in my education? Well, for one thing, our college focused a lot on um, ore deposits and economic geology because that's where the jobs were in the 70s and 80s because gold had been deregul deregulated, the price of gold, and it had shot sky high. So there was a lot of mineral exploration going on. And we lived in that southwest part of Colorado, that Silverton mining area. You know, we, um, we just had a lot of that in our background. And then we were hired on right out of school because there were so many projects going in Colorado and Nevada. So, um, but I think it's mostly like what I said at the beginning, just a curiosity and a, a, a love of, of solving difficult problems that are like, you know, the things you see around you, how did they get there? Just that kind of curiosity, I'm not sure. Anybody else? A couple more before we quit? Yes. A couple more? Yeah. Uh, like you said, gold was like, the price of gold was fluctuating a lot. What was it like working uh, for a field that like, set the price of like, what you were doing like, fluctuating? Well, that part didn't concern me that much. I was just doing my job on a daily basis. Um, I think that was more the ma management concern. I didn't really... Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't, the, the, I know we, I can speak for my colleagues here too. We, uh, changed jobs a lot. That was part of our experience is that 
projects came and went. And that's kind of what you're referring to. It's not so much the price of gold, but just these projects where you come in, especially exploration, you come in, there's not, you don't find anything. They, they start the project, they shut it down. You know, this one happened to go for 10 years. That's pretty long for a, a geologic project. So um, yeah, Star, want to add to that? I, I remember that management would want us to want to make a profit. And, and sometimes they would make decisions that we thought were not the best in geologic terms. Because yes. They would high grade and they'd have to backfill some areas where we thought there was potential for a longer term mine. Yeah. But because they were stock and profit driven, they made business decisions and not uh, scientific yes. decisions. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So he asked, what was it like to work in a, a field where the where that's, things are fluctuating? And then Star added, Star, my colleague, who was my college roommate <laughs> 45 years ago, um, who married the boss. Some people find gold, other people find love in this field. Um, she said, yeah, management would tend to worry about the prices and they would tend to cut corners, safety corners sometimes. I had an engineer that used to say, I'd tell him, we're heading into some bad ground. You're going to want to do, so we're going to need to cut down the size of the openings and do some, get ready to do some good ground control, some shotcrete and maybe even some steel support. And he'd say, oh, that's something my wife would want to do. And then they would go ahead and not do what I told them to do. And then we would have problems with caving. And we'd end up putting in more ground support than we would have if we had done it at the beginning. So yeah, it was like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell you what, it's after one o'clock. If you want to stick around, uh, Diane's here for yeah, another please. half an hour ish in town. So come on up and visit. Otherwise, let's thank Diane one more time for a great talk. Thank you guys. <laughs> oh, so See you glad. next week. Thank you. Yeah, so use your creativity. Thank you. Oh my God. I'm so oh, glad that's over. That's great. You did a great job. You really did. <laughs> Good, thank I you. I hope you feel good. Yeah. It was well, it is like longer than I expected. Really? Yeah. We took this on a wild ride. It was so cool. Totally. Yeah. Well, now I want to talk more to GSA, though, about getting that material into publication. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you. Okay, folks, if you can still hear me, I'm just going to say a couple final words. Let me swing the camera around here, despite the technical problems today. Maybe that was... Okay, so um, I do want to do a couple of tech things at the end, but that bores most of you. So... Uh, how many did we have? We have more than 300 I see right now. Is that about what we had during the entire uh, talk? Just curious that way. And um, we have, if you missed the beginning of this, we have one more Friday at noon live stream next week. Aaron Donaghy, Purdue University. Um, we'll be flying into Seattle trying to get over the pass. Thank you. And uh, you are welcome to join us for that. Young man, can I help you? Oh, you just get oh, by. Gonna, yeah. Do you have time on Monday for an uh, advising appointment? Yeah, please send me an email. Yeah, and we'll find a time. Yep. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so, uh, Diane Grudy, uh, I met her once um, a couple of springs ago. And um, if you saw the YouTube video with Tom Alexander. Tom worked for Diane, and um, Diane wanted to give more detail to the operation. And so this was the first time hearing Diane give a talk. Uh, this YouTube thing has been helpful in many situations, including um, Chris Mattinson and Jordan Carey looking for an area to do some field mapping for our Geology 489, and they were running out of options. They wanted to do something next spring, and Diane 
I, I put Chris and Jordan in touch with Diane, who knew the details, obviously, of the Saddle Rock area. And so Diane was working actively with Chris and Jordan and our students last spring. So there's all sorts of connections and community kind of ties between many of these programs and some of these very specific things as well. So thank you for joining us today. Um, before I say goodbye, I want to try one little testing thing. So if a few of you want to hang on, and it looks like nobody's waiting to chat with me. So let, let me give this a try. So thank you. We'll see you next week. Okay. Tech-wise. This is mostly just a diary for myself, but possibly a couple of you will leave a comment or two that will work. In case you just joined us, I, I got everything set up about 11.15, which is normally about a half an hour before I start live streaming. And this camera that I'm looking into kept crashing, kept dying. So I'm unplugging, I'm plugging back in, I'm connecting to the computer, I'm unplugging. Uh, I'd have the camera working for a little while. I call this wide camera. Um, and then it, it stopped. So then I'm turning off the, you know, power in the room and the screens are off and the screens are back on and I'm, I'm going back and forth, back and forth. And then, you know, it's 1245 or 1145. You guys are waiting for me. I'm still just like trying to get the cameras to even turn on. I finally got the cameras to turn on, but when I finally and, and activated the screens and everything, this is way too much detail for most of you. For the first time ever, when I got to YouTube uh, and I hit the scheduled live stream, I don't know if anybody has done this. I don't know if you've ever live streamed, but once you get... Uh, about ready to live stream before you start saying, you know, start or go live, it says. You have to select, manually select your microphone and you have to manually select the camera that you're using. Well, for the first time ever, OBS, which is this operating system that I have to have multiple cameras and slides and everything else, was not an option. And it, for three different times, if turning everything off, turning everything back on, unplugging cameras, plugging cameras. I could not get OBS to show up as an option. And so that's why I've only been dealing with one camera this, this session, because it's the only thing communicating with YouTube. Right? And yet, on my other monitor, I can switch all the cameras like normal. But... That's why we went to the one camera and turned it around, as I can do right now. You know, this thing is, I, I think we were functional through the whole thing. But I guess I'm realizing right now, the only reason that I, I think the only reason that I couldn't see OBS as an option is because I updated the OS to Sonoma version two, or I don't know what the hell. But anyway, I just noticed in all this panic before I started with you that I did not turn on the virtual camera on OBS. And I'm just curious if, I, if I'm live streaming with you right now, this is the last thing we're going to do. If I live stream right now with you before I quit, and I, I'm going to turn on the virtual camera on OBS right now, I'm just, hang on. Okay, start virtual camera. Start virtual camera. Okay. Now I'm almost sure that I cannot. I can't select. Give me just a second. Oh, you know how you feel when you finish something that's really bad. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate your help. Yeah, you're still on this camera. I'll try one more thing. If I hit edit, uh, so I might, I crash myself, and I'll say goodbye right now. Here's to you. Here's to your health. Thank you for joining us. I might see you. I might go away by mistake, but I'm going to try to hit edit 
and select OBS while I'm live streaming. That's the thing I wanted to test. Let me try it. Uh, nope. Okay, so I got to say goodbye to Diana. Sounds like she's about ready to leave. So thank you for everybody. I'll uh, I'll work this out before Aaron's talk next week, I promise. Thank you. I love you and goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. This is what came in my mind later. You know, I can never take quickly. But I'm thinking it was her.